Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. Novak Djokovic is champion for a seventh time at the Rolex Paris Masters. He beats Grigor Dimitrov. Straight sets in the final. Paris double for Novak after winning Roland Garros earlier in the year. On this week's show, I'm going to talk about both players' big picture takeaways from the week. Then I'll get more specifically into the final, particularly what went wrong for Grigor Dimitrov. We'll zoom in on the two breaks of serve that Djokovic had in each set. And then I will discuss a couple of things that Novak does technically, tactically, that make things really, really tough on Grigor. All right? I'm going to start with Djokovic. I'm impressed. I am really, really impressed. To which you you may say, Gil, why are you impressed? This was his 40th Masters 1000 title record. He had won this particular event six times prior. What impressed you? How at this point can you be impressed? The day that I, I no longer can be impressed by greatness is the day I'll stop doing this. But let me explain to you specifically what was so impressive about this to me. No matches since the U.S. Open. He picks up a stomach bug. He finds himself three days in a row playing three set matches that last over two and a half hours long. And they were progressively longer and longer. Two hours, 39 minutes, two hours, 54 minutes, and then one minute over the three-hour mark against Andre Rublev. And physically, I mentioned the stomach bug, but not the best. Kind of struggling through it a little bit. Less than 100. Technically, also not the best. I mean, the Runa match was probably one of his lesser serving performances of the season. He had major issues with his backhand at certain portions of the Rublev match. There was... A lot that wasn't firing in the Greek Spore match. So sometimes we break down tennis into three separate sections. Physical, technical, mental. Well, physically he wasn't at his best. Technically he wasn't at his best. Mental has to pick up the slack, huh? And it did. And that, to me, was the takeaway here. And what was that specifically what impressed me was the mental toughness. Here you are with all of the things that I mentioned, throw in the fact that he's 36, he's won three majors on the year, it's November, you have younger guys, you have most players on the tour saying, the season's too long, my body hurts, it's tough to get going this time of year. If anybody has an excuse to feel that way, it's Djokovic, his age what he's already accomplished. So if he took his foot off the gas mentally, just a little bit, if if he was just 10% of that fire wasn't really in him for this tournament, given the circumstances, would have been pretty understandable, huh? Would have been really understandable. Instead, what happened? His competitive drive was off the charts this week. He didn't use the physical issue as an excuse to not try as hard, which a lot of players would do. He didn't even use it as an excuse to keep the points shorter, which most players would do, which Holger Runa did against him. No. Still still willing to run, still willing to defend, still understanding that that's what it was going to take to win matches. You know, that he wasn't going to be able to take the easy route out, find the easy winner from the back, go for broke, pull the trigger. No, none of that. Even even if he was tired, even if he was suffering out there. Came out for the final. Sure, the body didn't feel good. Pretty sure he said as much. Didn't come out in the final trying to keep points short. He just knew that that doesn't really cut it. And he's going to have to push through and be willing to suffer a little bit. And he was. Not only that, he raised his intensity. He battled in the big moments. He was extremely clutch. So it was just another example of how unbreakable, unshakable 
Djokovic's mental can be when all of these things are working against him and he has every reason just to, again, take it a little bit easier this week. Didn't happen. If he came out and played great and dominated everyone, I would have been less impressed. Seriously, I would have been less impressed. I've seen that a million times from Novak. But to have to suffer and fight as much as he did under these circumstances is such a great representation of why Novak is on the brink of an eighth year-end number one for his career after winning his 40th Masters 1000. And quick reminder, he hasn't lost since the Wimbledon final. We talked about, you know, after that loss to Alcaraz, I talked about it, I think, on Monday Match Analysis. I talked about it with Steve Flink. You know, there was a bit of a question. Okay, how how does he respond mentally to losing a five-set Wimbledon final to 20-year-old Carlos Alcaraz? And I thought, hey, is, this is going to inspire him. This is good. This is going to... This is actually going to add, probably add years to his career because he's going to be excited by this challenge. Certainly seems that way. Novak's had tough rivals his whole career. I think it's healthy for him. And I think that loss, you know, I'll say this. It just, it doesn't respond, doesn't surprise me that he's responded to that loss with not even a hint of dejection, but, you know, instead laser focus and a massive winning streak. As for Dimitrov. You feel for him. You really feel for him. He has not won a, won a title since 2017. He needs one. He deserves one. He should have one. And, you know, that, that that's part of it. Still, um, historic run for him. Even losing in the final. Like, this, this run in Paris was really, really, really good. Um... And when I say historic, here's how I'll kind of back up that statement because maybe that sounds a little bit hyperbolic. He's been on tour 24 years now. This is, oh, sorry, 14, 14 years now. This is the second time he's been, he's beaten two top 10 players in one regular tournament run. So he did it 2017 ATP Finals. You can count that if you want, but obviously anyone who wins the ATP Finals is going to is gonna have multiple... Okay, all wins are top 10 wins in the ATP Finals. Uh, the only other tournament he's done it, uh, Brisbane 2017. So it's pretty rare that he goes on a run like this. Not to mention, he, he also beat world number 11 in Hubert Hercoc. So um, the run is Musetti, Medvedev, Bublik, Hercoc, Tsitsipas... And he falls to Djokovic in the final, uh, which is a again a pretty great, pretty great reinforcement of kind of what we've seen from Dimitrov uh, since the U.S. Open, where he's been like literally a top six player in the world, and then since the U.S. Open, depending on where you fall on the argument, uh, top fifteen, maybe even top ten. In fact, the more I think about what I talked about in the mailbag, the more I think maybe the the take from the comment is right, but we won't. Uh, relitigate that. I still think it's a it's a fun debate topic whether or not Dimitrov has been a top ten player in 2023 as a whole. Fun debate topic. Basically, has the draw luck been so bad that it skewed Dimitrov's I guess year end rank and really he he should be top ten. That that's that would be the debate for the 2023 season as a whole. But certainly post U.S. Open, it's inarguable. Also inarguable. And I looked into this pretty carefully and closely. This is the third best season of his career. This is the third best year he's ever had at 32 years old in 2023. 2017 was his best year, clearly. I think that was a year-end number three for Dimitrov after winning the ATP Finals. Dimitrov won four titles that year, and he won 72% of his matches. His second best year was 2014. He won three titles that year, and he won 74% of his matches. Also had a Wimbledon semifinal in 2014. The only other year where he's recorded a title is 2013. But that wasn't a better year than this year. He won Stockholm that year. He made an, an additional final at a 250. Uh, so in 2023, he makes a Masters 1000 final. He has the third highest win percentage of any year in his career at 65%. 
And also in 2013, really poor at the majors, not that great at the masters. He was better in big events this year. So 2023, if you look at it, pretty inarguable, third best year of his career. Um, and since the U.S. Open, he's six and five versus top 20 competition. We've also talked about his consistency all year long. And I think I found kind of the ultimate stat that that will put a bow on it, that will really summarize just how well Dimitrov has played. Since Roland Garros, so starting at Roland Garros, Dimitrov has 11 losses. 10 of those 11 losses were to Turin guys. Guys we'll see in a couple of weeks at the year-end championship. Top eight players. Maybe not top eight at the time, but top eight now. 10 of those 11 losses. Only guy who's not a top player who beat him was Dan Evans in D.C. Okay, let's talk about the final. It's not an ugly score line. You know, it was 6-4, 6-3. That in itself doesn't scream blowout, doesn't necessarily scream one-way traffic. I think if you, you know, really digging in and really watching this match, it was a blowout. To me, it was a blowout. Djokovic did not face a break point, and Dimitrov very rarely was holding easily on the other end. So, you know, 10 Dimitrov service games. Djokovic won two or more points in eight of them. So in other words, Djokovic got to 30, so it was either a hold at 30, a hold at deuce, or a Djokovic break. That was eight out of 10 Dimitrov service games. And the big factor here, when it, you know, when you kind of distill it down and kind of get down to it, uh, unfortunately, was Grigor Dimitrov sloppiness. He was not as good in this final as he has been all week, as he has been regularly um, since the U.S. Open. He, he was just not that guy. Why didn't Dimitrov have it in this match? There are a couple of theories you can throw out. I tend to think his legs were kind of shot. And the reason I lean that way is just because of what I was seeing. I didn't like Dimitrov's movement. And I also thought there was some evidence in the way he was approaching his tennis uh, that he didn't really want to dig in physically. There wasn't a lot of shot tolerance. He was overplaying on a lot of his attacking balls and redirecting a little bit too early, a little bit too often for my liking uh, in this matchup. There was really only one game that I thought Dimitrov was willing to grind. And in my opinion, it was his best return game. It was the 5-4 game, Djokovic trying to close out the first set. That was the one game that I thought Dimitrov played the percentages and tried to trust his legs and his movement and his consistency and try to dig in and make Djokovic earn it. Other than that, it was a really aggressive Grigor Dimitrov who was simply missing a ton. Four three setters on this run. He played, you know, nearly three hours against Medvedev in the second round. He played a little bit over two and a half hours against Tsitsipas in the semifinal. That was a third set tiebreak. I don't think the Hercoc match was physical, but still, there was a lot of tennis there. There were some long matches. Legs didn't seem to have it. Oh, and I guess I'll throw, I'll toss this into the evidence, although I don't think, you know, I think it should be uh, with the caveat that Dimitrov has had strapping on his leg for uh, a, a few matches. Uh, I don't know. I don't know when this week we started to see the strapping, but certainly had it for the semifinal. And uh, yeah, I mean, he he had it in this final. So that's the fatigue theory. There's the head-to-head -head theory. You know, he's playing Novak Djokovic, who's dominated him. Head-to-head -head was 11-1 to coming in. That can do funny things to the brain as a tennis player. You can, like I, I said earlier, Dimitrov was overplaying on his attacking balls. You'll see that a lot. When somebody's been dominated, they overplay. They think they have to... They think they have to redline. They think they have to do more than they're capable of. You know, Grigor, he's such a veteran. It's not my preferred theory, but it's a theory. 
for why he was below his level in this final. And then the last one would just be the the drought that he's had in finals. You know, he just, again, he hasn't won a title since 2017. That can also do things to the psyche. That's that's a lot of scar tissue. Now, he's actually lost more semifinals than he has finals. He had only lost two finals since 2017. The, the, the semifinals, I don't know what his record is in semis, but uh, it's certainly not good. Uh, still, you know, nonetheless, the drought that he's had in finals, that's another factor that could have affected him. Net-Net didn't play well. And to me, that's actually kind of what defined the match. If I'm going to boil it down and simplify it, I don't think Novak had to be that good in this final because Grigor was just giving him a lot of errors. Now, certainly Novak was was impressive in, in some ways in terms of his consistency and his defense and his absorption. But I just, I don't think, one thing I don't think is that Djokovic needed to leave his comfort zone. Physically, technically, tactically, yeah, it was really just keep the ball deep in the court, stay in good position, defend, absorb, and he was going to get misses. So let's take a look at that in more detail. Some specific examples of what I'm talking about. It's going to kind of underline exactly what I'm saying here, which is that Dimitrov was uh, really just too sloppy to win this match. Again, pains me to say it, but it's how I feel about, about this match. Um, we'll look at the two breaks of serve. So in the first set, the break came at three all and we'll pick it up from 30 all. We have a forehand, a forehand rally here. Dimitrov, good trade cross court, gets some nice width, pushes Djokovic back, but Novak is going to reply with a really good trade of his own. This ball's deep. This ball's about a foot in front of the baseline, if that, and Dimitrov is kind of hugging the baseline. So he's taking this almost as a half volley, but he's going to try to redirect this ball down the line. Really tough shot to pull off. And it goes long. It's a ball that Dimitrov just went for too much on at, at 30 all to, to go hard down the line off of such a deep Djokovic forehand. That ball just has to go back cross court. Or if it goes down the line, it needs to be it needs to be kind of massaged down the line. You have to at least take some pace off. Next point, Dimitrov hits a wide serve, and Djokovic actually misread it. He thought it was going T, but he's going to do the Novak thing and kind of contort his body and still find a way to just make the return. Still, Grigor, at this point, should win this point, like pretty much every time. This ball is going to land pretty short. And it looked like for a second there, Dimitrov was going to do the delayed serve and volley, or as Robbie Koenig would say, the serve and survey. I can't do the accent. I'm sorry. Um, so we kind of, you can't see it on the screenshot. After he hits the serve and he sees what Djokovic is doing positionally, he for a second, he starts sprinting in. He darts in. But then he realizes he's not going to get there in time. The ball is kind of landing too short. He's going to have to let it bounce. And he takes it out as a backhand. I feel like if he if he didn't have that moment of indecision, he probably could have taken this ball on the forehand. But still, it's an absolute sitter. Grigor is loading this up and drills this backhand right into the net. Doesn't even hit the tape. It's actually pretty low on the net. And that's the break of serve. There's nothing... Grigor didn't make a bad decision. This is just a really bad... Uh, actually indecision, a, a momentary indecision, followed up by a midcourt backhand. This is not a ball he Dimitrov practices a lot, I'm sure, because, again, normally he would take this as a forehand, not a backhand. It's still a, a really bad miss. So that's the break serve in the first set. And by the way, uh, if you look at that entire game, because I, I don't want to cherry pick, right? It would be misleading if Djokovic played, like, two spectacular points to get to 30 all. And then I'm just showing you the two Dimitrov mistakes and I'm saying that he messed up. So let me also give you the full context of the game. Dimitrov missed a forehand inside in that he just, he was attacking and he hit it long, bona fide unforced error. And then the other one was bad luck. So Dimitrov actually broke a string, had to hit a bad drop shot, lost the point. 
Tough luck there. But three unforced errors in that game. Let's go to the second set. Now, uh, this is 2-3 second set. Add in for Dimitrov. I'll give you the context of the full game after, but let's pick it up from add in. He's got Djokovic moving to his forehand wing. Novak is going to go cross court. Actually drops it short enough that Dimitrov can attack this ball. And I agree with Dimitrov's decision to redirect down the line in this case. I think it's the, the right shot. And unfortunately, he catches it a fraction late. And he went really big on this ball. And he missed it wide. He, it actually might have been wide and long. I'm not sure if it was long, but it was definitely wide. But Dimitrov is hitting an approach shot here. And the rule of thumb on an approach shot is you don't need to hit a winner. Like, you're in great position. Grigor's done everything right here. He's found the ball to attack. He's taken time away. He's moved inside the court. He, he, he's going to have Djokovic. He's going to put Djokovic in a really tough spot here. You don't need to hit a winner. And I just think he overplays this ball. Now it's deuce. This is off the serve. Djokovic forehand return cross court. And Dimitrov, again, kind of straddling the baseline. He has Djokovic off the center line. There's some space down the line. I don't mind Grigor going down the line off of this ball at all. I think it's a pretty good ball to, to attack. But he misses it. Almost the same exact miss. It's another redirect down the line. It's another ball that he catches just late. It's another ball that he misses about two and a half to three inches wide going really big. And like, there's a difference between building the point and looking to finish the point. And I think these these two balls, one was an approach shot, one was not, but they were good balls to attack, but they weren't good balls to, to try to finish on. And it felt like Dimitrov was going for the winner on both without, and uh, it was just a little bit too much. Okay, next one. Now it is break point. I think this is a second serve. Djokovic backhand return. Really safe. Like, he understands Dimitrov's been really loose in this game. He's made a ton of unforced errors. So why go for the aggressive return if you're Novak? Just make it. He goes to Dimitrov's backhand. First ball backhand from Grigor. He's going down the line here, and uh, at least he doesn't miss another one wide, but this one he misses along. Uh, I can't fault Dimitrov, really, for the shot selection here. I mean, he was just trying to rip the ball. Looked like into a pretty big target, and he just missed. So I don't know what to say about that miss. It was just a bad, unforced error, naked miss, you know, really kind of hard to explain, which happens. But you look at this game as a whole, and for Dimitrov, it was... Five unforced errors and a double fault by by my scoring. So, you know, that's every that's every Djokovic point. That accounts for every point that Djokovic won in the game. That's kind of what I'm saying here. It just wasn't... It was just too loose, too many mistakes, too many misses for Grigor Dimitrov. That's what this match came down to. And Djokovic, you know, he doesn't do that. So... That goes without saying. All that said, there were a couple of things that Djokovic did in this match and can do regularly in the Dimitrov matchup that should be highlighted because they, they are big keys, okay? Although, although you know, you know my opinion on Dimitrov's level in this match, uh, there are some things that Djokovic does really well that make this matchup difficult for Grigor. So, uh, first of all, responding to the backhand slice. And Dimitrov's slice all week long was an absolute problem for his opponents. It's my favorite slice on tour. You know, I think him and Dan Evans. Not sure whose is better. I don't know. It's close. But the slice is world class. And this Paris court, what do we say? It doesn't bounce. The ball doesn't bounce. So here's a shot that stays really low in all conditions. And, you know, Paris is basically going to give that backhand slice an injection of anabolic steroid. It's going to give people fits. So that's going to be something that Novak is going to have to contend with. And look, Novak, Novak throughout his career has, you know, I don't want to say, I don't want to say he struggled when 
players get the ball low on the backhand. But I, I will say this, like, it's a lot better than just hitting topspin backhands into Novak's strike zone, right? It's been in the past a lot more effective than that, okay? But I also think it's fair to say that Novak Djokovic's ability to handle the slice, respond to the slice, has improved leaps and bounds in recent years. And I think the first time I talked about this was uh, potentially, when was it? Might have been, might have been Wimbledon 2021 when I, when I started to talk about this quite a bit, which is just that Djokovic's backhand slice, his own backhand slice, has become incredibly reliable, like almost automatic, and he controls it with surgical precision. So I think the calculus for Djokovic in, again, reacting to Dimitrov's backhand slice, if Dimitrov hits one that doesn't stay ultra or, or hyper low, either that or Djokovic is positioned in a way where he can get up to the ball quickly, I think Novak still wants to drive the backhand. He wants to drive the two-hander hard, deep cross-court, or maybe even redirect uh, you know, down the line, or certainly if Dimitrov is coming forward behind behind it, you know, like a chip and charge, Djokovic wants to hit over the ball. But I think in the case where Dimitrov hits a great slice, one that's deadly, one where Djokovic can't even really get his feet all the way up to it, and the contact point is going to be really, really low. The question then becomes, what does he do in response to that and that is where, if you're a righty, a good backhand slice is going to be your savior. It is going to be the thing that gets you out of those situations time and time again. Novak has that. And look, I don't think it's all that often with Djokovic's slice that he hits one that wins him the point, or, or he stabs it, or he knifes it. That's because when he has a ball to hit, he hits it, right? But when you look at it from a more defensive lens, a backhand slice that's just supposed to remain unattackable, Novak's is incredible. He doesn't miss it. It stays deep. He can go line, and he can go cross. And what does Dimitrov like to do? The backhand slice is the setup shot. He goes short, low, slice into his power, into his backhand down the line, or ideally into his forehand inside in, his forehand inside out, etc. That's what he wants to do. If Djokovic is hitting great backhand slices deep, they stay pretty low as well. You just neutralize that pattern for Dimitrov. Novak does that. The second thing is Dimitrov, who was hugging the baseline in this match because of his aggressive mentality and his mindset, and Djokovic was also happy to, to seed ground, right? Novak was okay with being attacked in this match. He was ready to run, even though I think his legs probably felt like crap. He was still ready to go, still ready to defend. Dimitrov kind of probing the baseline, I think he struggled with Djokovic's depth into his backhand. That was one area, and Djokovic with his backhand cross court, what makes that shot so great? Other than the fact that he so rarely misses it, it's the depth. Like, it's just uncanny how often he's able to plaster that backhand trade cross court right in front of the baseline. Look, depth is great against everyone, but... I'll tell you what, it's a lot better against Dimitrov than it is against, I don't know, Dominic Team or Stan Vavrinka, who are seven feet behind the baseline, are going to just still kind of load up, wait until the ball is on the fall, and just rip the ball. Versus Dimitrov, who's hugging the baseline with his one-hander, and I'm intentionally only talking about one-handers here, hugging the baseline with his one-hander, and having to hit like baseline half volleys with uh with his drive one-handed backhand it all you know it takes away the slice and that's part of it when Djokovic gets great depth into Dimitrov's backhand you can't really slice a baseline half volley I mean I've I've seen 
I've seen it done by pros, but it's basically a shot that you just, it's too hard. You can't do it. So you take away the slice. Now you're looking at Dimitrov's drive backhand, which he's forced into because of the depth. And what I see on that shot, I honestly think that Grigor just swings a little bit too big off of that baseline half volley. And the bottom line is that he often doesn't square it up and he doesn't find a lot of precision with it. And I just thought Djokovic got a lot of errors from Dimitrov and I would consider these forced errors. He got a lot of forced errors from Dimitrov because he doesn't handle the depth well into his backhand. And if you don't handle depth well, Novak Djokovic is the last guy you want to be playing. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.